What's good, theorists? You know who it is. And if you're a fan of the most prolific label of the decade, you know what we're about to break down. One quick disclaimer before we get into it. While Boldy James is easily the most active member of the label, none of his albums or mixtapes were distributed by Griselda, so you won't find him on this list. But definitely check out his Versace tape EP though. And the same can go for the thousand other EPs the members have dropped. We're only discussing full length albums for this ranking. Now that the rules are out of the way, let's get to it. Number 18 conflicted soundtrack. When labels roll out a project that struggles with replay value, lacks quality contributors, and has no sense of direction, we find ourselves torn by the bittersweet alley-oop. Yes, we appreciate you making our jobs easier when writing these 15 plus entry rankings, but we're not trying to dismiss the work that went into such a meaningful project either. It's all constructive. The soundtrack to a film of the same name, we haven't spent the two hours it would take to get our own impression of the movie. Between this album and the dreadful reviews audiences have left for it, can't say we're hard pressed to press play. Ransom would come through and leave the booth smoking after his performance on Pride. While Wale popping out on the Hurt Business caught us completely off guard, in a good way, he just appeared on Pray For Parents. But still, this soundtrack was the last place we'd expect to find his vocals. Honestly, the soundtrack felt limited both by ingenuity and resources. Gun's ear for production alone should have made the album better than it was. Our biggest takeaway would be that 3.30 in Houston should have found itself on a more competent track list. Storytelling Benny and Derringer are a combination too potent to be wasted. If we trim conflicted down to its essentials, we could have came up with a cool three to five song EP. Probably wouldn't have changed his spot on this list though. Number 17, Armani Caesar, The Liz. Griselda as a label operates within a very slim margin of error, a razor thin double-edged sword if you will. With their similar subject matter and overlapping fan bases, artists on the label distinguish themselves through personality and production. Two aspects that play out more like weaknesses than strengths in this case. If there were two areas of the album that we would have re-envisioned, it would have been fine tuning her delivery and crafting a sound that feels cut from her own cloth. With this being her label debut, we're not mad they don't understand her role on the team yet, but that's where the label vets are supposed to provide the assist. Seeing as there weren't any features outside of the big three, we feel the label put an unnecessary buffer between her and the mainstream out the gate. The album did have its fair share of silver linings. Premier and Benny doused the booth in gasoline with Armani sparking the match on Simply Done. Manny Moo's freestyle and Palm Angels were also promising flashes of Caesar spreading her wings. Our critiques of the album more so stem from the label's inability to broaden its audience and market to women. Yeah, it's got strong bones, but formulaic intros haven't been their MO before. Hey man, if it ain't broke. Number 16, Armani Caesar, The Liz 2. While the album is dealing with some reoccurring issues from the first installment, don't let the placement fool you into thinking thinking there weren't any noticeable improvements made. For starters, they cashed out on a Kodak feature for Diana. This confirmed our hunch with the right moves and management, Armani's mainstream breakthrough is right around the corner. But honestly, that song was still a hook and maybe even another feature away from making real waves. Her chemistry with Benny, Khan, and West also took a significant step up, with $100 Hiccup being a standout for sure. It's true that Ice Age and Queen City caught our ear, but the song that we wanted to enjoy the most psyched us out, pun intended. Laced by B King with the hook from Queendom Come, we're wondering why a certain DMV anthem maker didn't also get a call. With Wale popping out on not one, but two Griselda records prior to this one, we don't know why the baton wasn't relayed. Not even a remix? Hopefully by the time Caesar's next project rolls around, she's found a go-to producer, our money's on conductor, and two or three well-known features that can complement her on a track. Based off her release schedule, shouldn't be too long now. Number 15, Griselda. WWCD. Produced entirely by Derringer and Beat Butcher, what would Sheen Gun do possesses undeniable significance to the group. It lands this low, however, due to one-dimensional artistry and a somewhat limited vision. Rest in power to Machine Gun Black, an unofficial inspiration behind the project and a family member to Benny and Conway. While we can admire the drive to honor his legacy, there are pockets on the album that make us feel like we're listening to Groundhog's Day. Striking out on major features, 50 Cent and Eminem both fail to push the album sonically. Raekwon just did the intro so he doesn't get too much of the blame, but if you ask us, that's a missed opportunity in itself. Aside from Conway, the group sound lethargic and uninspired for the majority of these tracks, especially when you take into account Westside coming off of Supreme Bly and Tail, and Benny had just dropped Tana Talk 3. City on the Map, The Old Groove, and Dr. Birds were some of the songs we felt embodied the group's best. But between the production and performances, we would understand if you would rather copy material from Pusha T, Freddie Gibbs, or any other artist with a 
similar buzz at the time. The album certainly fanned the flame of interest around the country, and there's something to be said for that. But at this point of their journey, even without hindsight, it's clear that the trio's teamwork had a long way to go. Number 14, West Side Gun, who made the sunshine. Just on the two eligible projects Gun released in 2020, he was averaging about 12 songs per album. Features though? more like 17 per tape. As fans of the art, his albums sonically progress by leaps and bounds. But as fans of the artist, Gunn's albums are starting to feel like launch pads for everyone but him, like a stylish DJ Khaled. So while many of the individual performances might have eclipsed an album like Fly Guy, the album doesn't have enough personality or direction to count itself among the label's best. We love Caesar's vocals on Liz Loves Luger, a side we hope to hear more of. But it definitely should have been her interlude alone. Wes could have set that verse out. Good night has to be one of the most underrated gems in Griselda's catalog. Gunn put on a Biggie-esque performance when recounting how he had to get his 10 bricks back. But in the case of Pupil and Master, Slick Rick reminds audiences why he's widely considered one of the greatest storytellers ever. Just Blaze's production on 98 Sabres confirms our working theory that Gunn's albums are testing grounds for new sounds and concepts. He doesn't seem to have the same crossover ambitions as Benny or the same technical perfectionism as Conway, so we're better to bounce ideas off the wall. With every release, we look forward to hearing Gunn's ear for production, being surprised by his range of collaborators, and even the occasional West Side Pootie update. But since Supreme Blind Tell, Wes's solo limelight seems to be less and less a priority. Again, based off his level of prolificness, it won't be long before we can put that theory to test as well. Number 13, West Side Gun, Fly God. Despite popping up on most of our radars around 2020, Westside's delivery and approach have been polished from the start. Serving as a testament to Gunn's consistency and vision, a lot of the qualities that have shined through his discography up until now are either present or in the works on his 2016 solo. When taking the reins on tracks like Mr. T, Sheen Gunn, and Hall, Gunn stands firm in his abilities as an MC over silky smooth production. He does, however, adopt more of a pass-first approach when joined by MCs like Benny, Sky Zoo, and Action Bronson. With performances on Dunks, 50 Inch Zenith, and Dudley Boys highlighting his deficiencies on the mic. Benny did try to warn us all on Mr. Chow Hall. Say West is the brains, uh -huh. and Benny is the star. Conway the silliest with the balls, well, I couldn't agree more. Narrowly avoiding the bottom five, Fly Guy was the pilot episode that successfully got the show off the ground. It might not get the recognition its creativity and gravity should warrant, but it's chock full of material that held up pretty well to be in closing on that 10 year mark. Number 12, Benny the Butcher, Burden of Proof. As we mentioned earlier, 2020 was a big year for the label. The last, but certainly not the least, Burden of Proof capped off a five album run that had Griselda buzzing more than anybody else in the game. Securing features from Rick Ross, Tunchi, and Big Sean, the Butcher's profile had clearly risen since his 2018 LP. While the album would receive strong reviews from critics, we think we speak for the Griselda faithful when speculating as to why it didn't receive the same love from fans. You know that old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, that's only half true. Griselda took the rap game by storm, not because they were doing something that had never been done, but because they reintroduced it at just the right time. They had found the sweet spot between 90s nostalgia and 2010s curiosity. So while the label had started to bubble into the mainstream, it all felt organic. By enlisting Hit Boy's polished Just Add Water sample loops, it felt like Benny was bringing himself into the mainstream rather than making the mainstream come to him. Big mistake. We actually think fans give this one too much hate, but we can understand wanting more from his features with Toon, Sean, and Gibbs. After hearing them rip Alchemist beats in recent years, we can only imagine how raw and dynamic those performances would have been. We want to give Hit Boy his bouquet while he can smell them. His consistency and quality have given Nas new life in the 2020s, but with that consistency comes a certain level of predictability and safety. Qualities the label stands in opposition of. Number 11, West Side Gun, and then you pray for me. Gun's ability to curate a sound and convey a shared vision makes him the easiest artist of the group to work around. This can be heard in the range of talent he worked with throughout the album. We get vintage That Piff mixtape flashbacks with DJ Drama, Trapaholics, and DJ Holiday drops throughout the record. Benny and Conway try their hands at some Take Keith production on Costas. In addition to collabs with Denzel Curry, ESTG, and Ty Dolla Sign, Gun takes it upon himself to deepen the synergy between Griselda in Dreamville with J.I.D. torching his verse on Mama's Primetime. Mr. Green and the team behind the boards went ballistic on a track that landed in our top 10 for the year. 
call us crazy, but we think Dreamville and Griselda got something in the works. Obviously, Cole popped out on Johnny P's caddy, and Jid touched down on Mama's primetime, but he also dropped his 30 freestyle on New Year's produced by Conductor Williams. Let us know down in the comments, would you be down for a tape between the two camps? We think a Griselville record would be dope. Anyway, the album enjoys quite a few peaks throughout its runtime, but as has become a running gag at this point, no cohesion. Wes has all but completely shelved his storytelling chops. And it's true, he spared no expense on production, rolling out one of the richest and most deeply layered projects of the 2020s. It's just difficult awarding Gunn for his vision when it feels like the most elaborate group project we've ever heard. On a side note, we didn't even realize Gunn had gotten RZA back behind the boards until doing the research for this video. Talk about playing it close to the vest. Number 10, Mac Hami. HBO. The only album from the label struck from all DSPs, Mac's 2016 Griselda debut. We know it's Mac Hami, not Mac, but it was a long shoot day and I said Mac like a thousand times. Forgive us is as elusive and mysterious as he is. We have a confession to make. Remember when we mentioned personality and production earlier? We were really talking about Mac Hami. Not only does his incorporation of his heritage give his sound and material a truly unique insight, he's essentially blossomed into the artist we had always envisioned Yasin Bey would eventually become. We know the two artists are one of a kind and we haven't heard too much of how they feel about the comparisons, but Mac's antagonistic view on media and propaganda echo most his sentiments from over 20 years ago. Flooding his fans with music is just an unexpected bonus. Max delivery and execution throughout HBO would be more aggressive than what we're used to from him, but as unrefined as his style was pre-Pray for Haiti, it gave us classics like Snow Beach, Bay 6, 1080p, and the title track. The album's 18 songs flow pretty seamlessly. That being said, we can hear just how essential Gun was in Pray for Haiti's inception when listening to Tunnel Vision. To do it pretty much from the label's genesis and carry the records without features, the 10th spot on the list isn't bad at all. Number nine, West Side Gun, Supreme Blind Tail. What we consider to be the birth of the modern day West Side Gun, Supreme Blind Tail sees Gun both paying homage to GFK's classic 2000s LP and locking in place the aspects of his artistry that would get the label over the hump. Not only would his ad-lib game take its final steps into elite status, but Gun, real name Alvin Worthy, proved that the label wasn't some niche underground act incapable of achieving crossover success. With features ranging from Jada Kiss and Busta Rhymes to Anderson Pock and Els High, Worthy had found the skeleton key and used it to roll out 17 track cheat codes or albums semantics. This would be our introduction to West Side Pootie on Amherst Station and the first instance of Wes, Benny, and Khan joining forces on Wax. The first that we could find at least. Beats from Alchemist, Harry Fraud, Static Selector, Ninth Wonder, and Pete Rock ensured Gunn's second studio release would have your attention for all 51 minutes. Number 8, West Side Gunn, Pray for Paris. By the time Gunn's third LP had taken shape, his impact on the game had already been forever etched into hip-hop's collective tapestry. Before everyone's album sounded like carbon copy alchemist imitations, Westside and Virgil Abloh met in the middle for one of the most immersive and captivating artistic rollouts we've ever seen. Abloh designed the album cover using Caravaggio's David with the head of Goliath. It was clear Westside was sending a symbolic message to the industry, the underdog had arrived. With the help of artists like Joey Badass, Tyler the Creator, Freddie Gibbs, and Wale, in addition to producers like Camouflage Monk, Alchemist, Primo and Jay Versace, Wes painted a canvas so vivid and enthralling that listeners who couldn't point Buffalo out on the map had the project topping a lot of year-end lists before it was all said and done. There are plenty of solid cuts on the album, including 327, Sean vs. Flair, and French Toast, but we'd argue that the most impactful inclusion on the album had to be Boldy on Clairborne Kid. The Versace tape would give us a more in-depth look into the mind of Boldy James, but this album served its launch pad duties by putting him in the front of the biggest audience of his career at the time. Of course, Wes's work with Tyler was probably the most high profile for the label, but nobody has been as prolific and dependable as Boldy. Eh, let's agree to split the difference. Number seven, Rome Streets, Kiss the Ring. We found that more often than not, labels get their first taste of success by having two or three rappers that emanate their own gravity. They maintain that success, however, by bringing new talent up through the ranks. When you hear the way Rome and Conductor play off each other, you get a better understanding of Griselda's ability to scout and develop artists, both behind the boards and in the studio. With an audible hunger and delivery full of determination, Streets laces kiss the ring with bangers that would even keep Benny and Conway on their toes. Of course, just because you've released a sizable amount of music, that doesn't 
mean you'll instantly click with a new system. So while Rome's catalog would scream season vet, his episodic flow and delivery remind us that even Benny and Conway needed an adjustment period before hitting their stride. Don't get us wrong, his fluidity works on songs like Reversible, Long Story Short, and In Too Deep, but it can also come across as unstructured or chaotic on songs like Fashion Rebel, Non-Factor, and Big Steppel. All good songs, but some remain in rotation longer than others. Having an artist like Rome be your fourth or fifth option just drives home the point that Griselda is balanced and fundamentally sound from top to bottom. As he tweaks his blend of flow and pace, he'll easily become one of the most promising artists on the label. Mark my words. Number six, Benny the Butcher, everybody can't go. Never let it be said that Griselda doesn't respond to competition in full measures. Who remembers Hit Boy and Alchemist dropping their producer's version of Control in March of 20? Well, they took that idea a step further and basically made their own It's Almost Dry. With the duo splitting production duty 7-5 Hit Boy's way, it seems that Benny was trying to see which producer understood his sound better. We applaud the initiative, but did he really need them to trade beats back and forth to know it was Uncle Al? Hit Boy showed up and out on tracks like How to Rap, One Foot In, and the title track. But what has he been cooking up all those albums for if he can't strong arm Nas to jump on back again? We get that Snoop is grandfathered in the cosign circuit, but but back again sounded and felt like it was left over from the King's Disease sessions. We need to hear all the gritty New York legends join the Griselda verse. That goes for Hove too. While we're looking at potential hit boy miscues, whose idea was it to have Babyface Ray and Jada on the same track? They each bring something very unique to the table, which coincidentally cancels out the other's contributions when you're putting it over hit boy's production. Alchemist might have had the more immersive soundscape, but he's got his own sins to answer for. Is there beef between Benny and Boldy? Griselda Express had an opportunity to unite the big three and the con creature over Alchemist production, a combination we haven't heard yet. Instead, we got Rick Hyde running with the group. That's not a knock on Hyde either. We know him and the BSF have been cooking, but Bodie and Alchemist are like air and water, both essential and at their best when found together. Besides, we're not going to act like Weekends and the Perrys wasn't one of the best songs off TT4. We know the album recently came out, so we're definitely not ruling out the benefit that its potential staying power could have on moving up in the future. Everybody Can't Go is clearly Benny trying to enjoy the best of both worlds. Still, Hip Boy Beats and a Babyface feature is not enough to convince us that you're serious about crossing over. All things considered, we do still recommend giving the album a spin if you haven't already. Our favorites being TMVTL, Buffalo Kitchen Club, and How to Rap. Number five, Conway, From a King to a God. Of the big three, it's strange to think about Conway's intro being the most recent to grace us with its debut. We think it worked out for the best. We get a scary one-two punch with him and Gibbs on Seen Everything But Jesus. Their second collab of the year following Alfred those babies and fools. We'd argue that Freddy got the better of the two exchanges, but then that would imply it wasn't a win-win for everyone involved. We also get exceptional performances from Lloyd Banks on Juvenile Hell and Method Man on Lemon. Talk about knowing your lane and cruising in it. Remember those primo Griselda collabs I mentioned earlier? Yeah, Nothing Less is easily the best of the bunch. From its placement as the album's outro to Prem's Dunn and Bruce Street sample to Conway's delivery, the two checked off every box. Honestly, this track more than any of the others made us realize we need to see a Conway tape exclusively produced by Premiere. The album as a whole is a pretty enjoyable listen from cover to cover, but him and Armani linking up on Anza did throw us for a loop. If you told us to rank artists on the label by the likelihood of them working with Murder Beats, Conway's name would have certainly been towards the bottom of the list. With his reputation as a lyricist being one of the label's biggest selling points, we do find that Conway has more or less typecast himself in a more niche market than Benny and Westside. Doe and Damani is our pick for the best cut off the album, but don't sleep on Spurs 3. B. Butcher was looking like pop with Benny, Con, and Wes doing their best Tim, Manu, and Tony impressions. Y'all can argue about who's who. Number four, Conway, God Don't Make Mistakes. Building on the momentum he accrued on From a King to a God, Conway's sophomore effort was initially supposed to be his debut. The album went through several delays during its creation, but even as far back as 2018, Westside had told us it was 90% complete. This might be one of the few albums that found its execution ultimately exceeding its expectations. With songs like Stressed, Wild Chapters, and God Don't Make Mistakes, the machine becomes more than just a cutthroat MC, he becomes a narrator. Walking us through a tumultuous period in his life that almost saw paralysis,
this as the best possible outcome. Conway's stories are so detailed and intimate that we wouldn't be surprised if he was reading straight from a journal entry. His collab with Ross and Wayne on Tear Gas did not disappoint, nor did John Woo flick with Gun and the Butcher. But easily the most unexpected and underappreciated collab to come off the label, this man had Jilly from Philly in the studio dropping rhymes on Chanel Pearls. They weren't beginner bars either. God Don't Make Mistakes sit so high up on our list because of Conway's willingness to double down on his strengths while improving upon areas of his life and artistry that he hadn't gone in depth about on his first go round. Neither album did particularly well from a commercial perspective, but we also don't think there's a clear cut barometer of mainstream reception that they're trying to reach. From a King to a God will receive marginally better reviews, but the difference between the two could essentially be boiled down to 1A and 1B. Number three, Benny the Butcher, Tana Talk 3. Gritty, abrasive, and impactful. Those are the first three words that come to mind when discussing Benny's breakthrough debut album. In our case, we saw the airbrushed cover art of Machine Gun long before we heard the album from start to finish. Once we did give the project a listen, we knew the label had a long and promising future ahead as long as they stuck to this formula. If you find yourself at a Benny show anytime in the near future, we're sure you're going to be treated to set essentials like rubber bands and weight, broken bottles, 97 Hove, and Joe Pesci 38. The album doesn't stop there though. Benny and Royce Trey blows on Who Are You with Melanie Rutherford on the chorus. We get some vinyl cracks to accentuate Fast Eddie and even get Benny, West, and Mayhem Lauren dropping bombs over the ominously laid Echo Long. If you couldn't tell by now, basically we're praising the album for its cohesion and lack of blind spots. It's a classic case of Derringer pushing alcohol Alchemist and Alchemist pushing Derringer. Without checking the credits, it would be hard to distinguish the two apart. That's how committed they were to the grimy and menacing sound Benny wanted to introduce listeners to. We know it's a hot take, but Joe Pesci 38 hasn't really aged well for us. It just feels like that one loose end that starts to make your clothes unravel, if that makes any sense. If we're being as objective as possible, we'd also argue that the album's features serve more to limit the project than elevate it. Royce was solid as always, but when taking the rest of Griselda's body of work into account, this has to be the most you love it or you hate it album on the list. By that we mean you pretty much know what you're getting from the outset of the album. No shifts in momentum or narrative, no energy altering collaborators, just an all in return to the basics. Lucky for us, Benny clearly studied the reception he got from Tana Talk 3. While he might not have changed his collaborators up too much, he certainly employed less suspenseful production. Also, between me and you, we could entertain arguments for this or God Don't Make Mistakes at number three. We gave this the edge because it might just be the most impactful album the label has released to date, but we certainly wouldn't argue it's more well-rounded than Conway's second LP. Number two, Mac Hami, Pray For Haiti. Up until this point, Mac had to be the label's best kept secret. Obviously, if you're familiar with Griselda's history, you know that Wes, Conway, and Mac were there when it all started. But many listeners weren't even aware Mac was on the label, seeing as Benny was arguably the face of the label by the time they gained traction. Needless to say, Mac spent his time away from the limelight perfecting his craft. We would attribute the insurmountable leap between number 10 and number two to a more focused vision. In large part due to Gunn's executive production, Hami's pen has always been sharp, no concerns there. But the soundscape of his first Griselda LP differed so drastically because we believe he was more involved behind the boards. We haven't read or heard anything to set that in stone, just an ear test kind of feeling. But we saw similar results when Gunn rolled out Pray for Paris. If Westside is known for anything at this point, it's fashion and production. We say that to say, the ingredients were always there. Mac is still amazing audiences with his ability to jump between flows, switch between English and Creole seamlessly, and deliver introspection on one song and outrage on another. This wasn't Conductor's introduction to the label, but it definitely was his first standout performance. Fole Adu, Macro Jackson, and the Stellar Ray Theory is one of the nastiest three-peats on wax you're gonna get from any producer. Combine that with the fact that Camouflage Monk might have Keyword might outperformed him with Murder Season, No Blood, No Sweat, and Rami. And Pray For Haiti's spot sounds like a no-brainer. Personally, Rami did strike us as one West Side appearance too many. We would have rather heard Conway get the assist, but that does little to diminish the overall quality of the album. If it hadn't been for Call Me If You Get Lost, we'd argue Mac would have been standing alone with Album of the Year in 2021. Number one, Benny the Butcher, Tana Talk 4. When we're talking about well-rounded, impactful albums that embody not just an artist, but a label's collective peak, then we're getting into Tana Talk 4 territory. 
territory. Starting off with lead single Johnny P's caddy, we knew Benny unlocked the final chapter of the game when he and Cole hit us with four minutes of hell over Alchemist production. After cycling through tracks like 10 More Commandments, Super Plug, and Bust a Brick Nick, we felt like Snoop. With the perfect balance of solo highlights and high performance features, no one entity is responsible for the success of the album. Some people believe a classic album can't contain a single skill. Some believe it needs to have an unrivaled impact and influence. We can't say we have the definitive answer to meet that criteria. We do, however, maintain that an album is only as strong as its weakest song. In this case, we think Billy Joe seals the argument as to whether or not Tenor Talk 4 will be eligible to claim classic status when its time comes around. The Butcher's third studio LP would make unexpected commercial waves when it peaked just outside the top 20 on the Billboard 200. At this point, everyone knows how pointless it would be to expect the Grammys to really be tapped into hip hop on a cultural level. In this instance, though, we find ourselves particularly agitated. After nominating Gibbs for Best Rap Album with Alfredo, they can't hide behind the excuse of ignorance anymore. So to nominate Pusha T's stale recreation of a career highlight tape with It's Almost Dry over Tenor Talk 4, we're convinced they're spinning these projects with the volume turned all the way down. Be sure to check out our 10 times the Grammys got it wrong video while you're at it. Ultimately, TT4 stands above the rest because of Benny's ability to fuse the label's best elements into a singular 40 minute listening experience. Damn, we done already? Theorist, if you made it this far, let us know down in the comments. What's your favorite Griselda song and your favorite album? Also, go crazy with that like button, subscribe if you still aren't on the wave, and check out that super thanks if you want to make all our dreams come true. It's your man CJ Williams signing out for the culture. Peace.